Welcome back. Our next guest has lived many stories in one lifetime, and it is a blessing to us that she has chosen to share those stories with us. Lucienne Block has beautifully, really exquisitely written these personal essays that explore the world of refugees after Hitler's Europe and on the Upper West Side of New York City. Block's parents initially believed that New York was only a temporary stop just before they could go back. But after realizing that there was no going back, New York became her home. She grew up with the sounds of visitors speaking German, Yiddish, French, Polish, Flemish, and Dutch. I can hear it now. As the oldest child of four and the only one born in Europe, Block was keenly aware of and haunted by the horrors that prompted her parents' immigration. She felt and assumed responsibility for Americanizing them, which by the way, she never achieved. I'm sure many of us can relate to similar, if not exactly, those stories. Her newest book, Whistling in the Dark, is a collection of these personal essays that go on from the 1950s through the changes in our own culture, personal changes during this cultural upheaval, and all the lives and expectations of women in that time and political realities. And now on our Mother's Day episode, it seems so, so appropriate to speak to these stories and hear from Lucienne who talks about not only her mother, but also her mother and other women. And I'd like to take a moment to read to you from her beautiful story titled Inside Stories. This is an excerpt. I might not hear the echoes of the past in my kitchen if it were definitively contemporary, but it isn't, and I do. That high ceiling room looks and substantially is the same as it was the very first day. The paneled wooden cabinets, drawers, broom closet, pantry cupboards are original installed when the building's construction was completed in 1921. I sometimes wonder about the women who worked in my kitchen before me. Was the first one a triumphant suffragette? Was there a snazzy flapper stuffing naked Thanksgiving turkeys in there? <laughs> the mother of a Marine who died in Guadalcanal. I stand at the sink washing lettuce, scrambling eggs, making soup, slicing bread, clean countertops, empty the dishwasher, iron pillowcases, do what needs doing. And I sense generations of women keeping me company in my kitchen. In my, in, in home kitchens anywhere, wives, daughters, mothers, sisters, friends, grandmothers, household help, aunties, in-laws, some strong, some weak, the glad, the regretful, the angry and the forbearing, the lost and found souls, women who spent years and years in kitchens instead of designing bridges or performing brain surgery or heading multinational think tanks. It may be that some of the women who lived in our apartment before us were professionals and had jobs outside the house, taught or took classes, were active in civic, philanthropic, political, and cultural organizations, traveled widely. But what I hear in my head in my kitchen are women's everyday domestic noises and same old stories, the constant meals, chores, messes, the routine tedium, seemly housewifery the self-disappointment, stories amplified by the clatter of chopping, pounding, shaking, beating, cracking. I know those old stories have lost some traction these days, but they come with my kitchen's outmoded territory, with my own, and continue to weigh on me and pull at me. Welcome to the show, Lucienne. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. I am so glad to have you and to share you with our community because you have lived a childhood rich with story content and now you are finally sharing those stories after novels and other writings, but now you're telling your stories. Let's go back a little bit before that. Did you always want to write? I did. I I started out life and continue to be a voracious reader. Um, and I'm very, I was always very 
concerned with language, mainly because I didn't speak the language of the country. I mean, I went to school, to kindergarten the first day, I was five years old, and I didn't realize I didn't speak it, the same language as all the kids. Oh my. Fortunately, there was another refugee in the class, a little girl from Paris, so I had someone to talk to. But you learn, my parents didn't I don't know why they sent me to school. They must have known I would be in trouble there, but I, I, it ha that's what happened. So language has always been a ladder for me in a way. It gets me where I need to go, which it does for everyone. And I, I, I just devoured books. I still do. I read a lot. And at some point or another, I thought I'd write a little memoir for my children um, about my upbringing. And it became a novel, but it was not, it took me several, another book and several more years of writing to realize that I could tell the story that I thought I had told, but not well enough in the novel. I could tell it in an easier, more accessible form, accessible for me and for the reader. So I turned to the personal essays and I immediately felt at home in that form. It's a very flexible, very un... un it's not a categorical kind of, an, of a form you can pretty much do what you want in there because you're the ones making the decisions. And there is some invention in, it's not strictly nonfiction. Um, there is some invention in what I do, but nothing that, nothing that contradicts the initial truth of the whole book. So that's, that's what I do. <laughs> the sense I get is that you are, even if you are editorializing yourself even a bit, it's still you. You are the main character of the essays versus creating a character for your novels and telling the story through their eyes. Now we're hearing it from right. you. So how many languages do you speak? Um. Really, I speak French and English. Um, I married a Frenchman, so that reinforced the whole French thing for me. But um, I have listening capacities in German, I, I, which I really don't like to speak, but I do, I could if I had to. And I understand a little bit of Dutch. It's it's a different family of languages. It's hard to, but I, I, I heard it. My father spoke nine languages. So um, it was necessary in, you know, the business that he was in. Absolutely. But I also understand as a five-year-old going to school, when you have all of this noise floating around in your head and all of a sudden you realize that nobody else has that same noise. <laughs> yeah. Got to be a little bit distressing. It was. I spent a lot of time sitting in my cubby crying. <laughs> I'm sorry, but now that you're writing in English, we are so grateful. <laughs> we are so grateful. So tell us, tell us a little bit about, you know, just New York and how did New York influence the way you see life versus the stories that you've told from your family? And, and it feels to me like New York is its own character in your essays. Well, certainly the West Side in the in the fifties when I was growing up, um, it it was we had such freedom. Um, even, I mean, there was after we were about my sisters and I and my brother. After we were six or seven, we were allowed to go out on the streets alone, as long as we kept to the main streets, not the side, the little side streets, but 86th Street and the avenues were just, we could go to the planetarium alone. We could do all kinds of things alone because it was a very safe environment in those days. Well, that changed um, quite radically, but by then I was 
I was already older or already really in college um, when New York began to change. And it wasn't including the West Side, although that West Side, the Upper West Side has retained a lot of its character more than most other neighborhoods in New York. So I, it was all, everything I did was on the west side. I never went to the east side, as I said, except to be taken to down Fifth Avenue to a to buy a dress for a party dress or something. Mm -hmm. But my yeah, my parents had a very big social life. They went out practically every night. They had a lot of friends um, and a big two big families that came across the ocean with them. Not not the same time, but who also immigrated. So we were very busy. Um, it was it was fun. It was a very different time in New York City. It was a very different time. Yes, and having that world of immigrants and international influence and all of the energy and excitement, it also brought its own its own downside. You have another story that I read that talks about Mrs. Palachinka. Palachinka, yeah, Palachinka. There, there, there. That's a kind of uh, pancake, a crepe, a crepe, as we say. Um, yeah, there were there were several older people, my grandparents included, who had been completely uprooted um, and too old to make a new life in America and um, more or less impoverished. So there was a lot of attention paid to them, particularly to the lonely old women. So, Which yeah. was very special. And it, it your stories really talk about the care and the nature of nurturing the relationships that you did have. And from you, both mm -hmm. as a little girl and then growing into adulthood and becoming a mother, and the stories that you you tell from different perspectives, that it really takes us along a very, I would say, um, intricate cobblestone road <laughs> of yeah. your life, where each stone has its own its own color, its own specialty, its own incline and decline. And I, for one, am so grateful for the grace and the elegance of the way you've chosen to tell these stories. Do you find that um, your writing style is different between the novels and the essays? Well, I've only written two novels. The second, the first one was was uh, much more about my upbringing. And, but the second one uh, was, I have twin sisters who are younger than I and, um, I wrote a novel about twins, and it was not it was not good enough. Um, it, it then I stopped writing for quite a while, and then I decided that there were things in my first novel that I hadn't had the maturity to really explore, and I decided to do it in essay form. Um, so that's what I've done. It does give you a different a different form and source of expression. I will just point out, you said I've only written two novels. I will just point out that that's two more than most of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> just for a little perspective. <laughs> the fact that you are still writing and that you still have more to share and that you still are willing to take the time and put the pen to paper in, a, in the world of computers, which I know are just also everything in, in its own evolution influences how you tell your stories. But I really want to encourage our viewers to find this book in particular and, and really spend some time with Whistling in the Dark. And then my bet is they will seek out your two novels. So there will likely be more interest there. How can they find you? Where can they purchase the book? Uh, the current book, is, the book of essays, is on um, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope it gets into bookstores. It's just been published. Um, it, it's quite the pub date is is relatively only I think eight days old, and um, 
it's doing okay on those websites. It hasn't yet been reviewed. I'm hoping to get some reviews, in which case the bookstores will start ordering it uh, to have in stock. And I've, I've mobilized my entire army of friends to go into bookstores and say, ha, ah, I heard about a wonderful book. What will you get it for me? So. Well, that's also a strategy. So I can encourage our viewers as well. If you do pick up the book on Amazon and you do love it, please go into a local bookstore and ask them to carry it. We really appreciate the opportunity not only to support authors, but to support local bookstores as well. Right. And thank you so much for coming to join us today. I appreciate you. I love your book. I'm so grateful to share it with our community. And I look forward to bringing you back and we'll find out what happens to it as we move. I look forward to that myself. Thanks, Lauren. And we'll be right back.